This is the beginning of Chapter 5, Knowledge of Higher Worlds, Initiation, from the book An Outline of Esoteric Science by Rudolf Steiner. Between birth and death, human beings at our present stage of evolution experience three states of consciousness during ordinary life, waking, sleeping, and the state between them, dreaming. Dreaming will be considered briefly later on in this book, but here let's look at life in its two main alternating states, waking and sleeping. We achieve knowledge of higher worlds by acquiring a third state in addition to sleeping and waking. When we are awake, our souls are devoted to sensory impressions and the mental images they stimulate. When we sleep, these sensory impressions are silenced but our souls also lose consciousness. The experiences of the day sink down into a sea of unconsciousness. Now, let's imagine that the sleeping soul is capable of becoming conscious in spite of the fact that all sensory perceptions are excluded, as is otherwise the case in deep sleep, and that not even a memory of the day's experiences is present. In that case, would the soul find itself in a state of nothingness? could it be unable to have any experiences at all? It is only possible to answer these questions if we can actually induce a state of consciousness similar to this, if the soul is actually able to experience something even in the total absence of current and remembered sensory impressions. In this case, although the soul would seem asleep with regard to the ordinary outer world, it would not be asleep but would confront a real world, just as it does in the waking state. Now, this state of consciousness can be induced if we bring about the soul experiences made possible by spiritual science. Everything spiritual science tells us about the worlds lying beyond the world of the senses, including the information given in preceding chapters of this book, has been investigated by means of this state of consciousness. This chapter will discuss, to the extent possible in this book, the methods used to create the state of consciousness needed for this research. This state of consciousness is similar to sleep in only one respect, namely that it puts an end to all outer sense impressions and eliminates all the thoughts stimulated by these impressions. But although, during sleep, the soul does not have the strength to experience anything consciously, this other state of consciousness provides this strength, awakening a perceptive ability that only sensory impressions can arouse during our ordinary life. The soul's awakening to this higher state of consciousness can be called initiation. Initiation methods lead us out of our usual state of waking consciousness into a soul activity that makes use of spiritual instruments of observation. These instruments are already present in the soul in a seminal state, but they need to be developed. Now it's possible for people to discover at a certain point in the course of their lives that these higher instruments have developed spontaneously without any special preparation and that a certain involuntary self-awakening has taken place. As a result, these people find that their essential nature is totally transformed and that their soul experiences are infinitely enriched. They also find that no knowledge of the sensory world can possibly provide the bliss, the soul satisfaction and inner warmth that they now experience as a result of what is being disclosed to understanding that is not accessible to the physical eye, EYE. Strength and certainty will flow into their will from a spiritual world. Such instances of self-initiation do occur, but they should not tempt us to believe that the only right thing to do is to wait for this to happen and do nothing to bring initiation about through appropriate training. Since self-initiation can come about without observing rules of any sort, it is not necessary to talk about it here, but what will be described is how training 
can develop the seminal organs of perception lying dormant in the soul. People who feel no particular urge to do something for the sake of their own development may easily say that human life stands under the guidance of spiritual powers and that instead of intervening in this guidance we should patiently await the moment when these powers find it right to disclose another world to our souls. These people may well feel that there is a certain presumptuousness or unjustified desire in wanting to interfere with wise spiritual guidance. People who think like this will change their minds only when one particular thought makes a strong impression on them. This thought is, quote, This wise guidance has given me certain faculties, not so that they will remain unused, but so that I can put them to use. The wisdom in this guidance lies in the fact that it has planted the seeds of a higher state of consciousness in me. I understand this guidance only if I feel that human beings have an obligation to reveal everything their own spiritual powers can possibly reveal. Unquote. If this thought has made a strong enough impression on the soul, then the above-mentioned doubts about training for a higher state of consciousness will disappear. However, another doubt can still arise about this training. We might say, quote, Developing inner soul faculties constitutes an intervention in an individual's hidden holiest of holies and involves a certain transformation of that person's entire nature. It is inherently impossible for us to independently conceive of the means for bringing about such a transformation because only those who have personally experienced reaching a higher world can know how to do it. But if we turn to a person like this, we permit that person to have an influence on our own soul's hidden holiest of holies. Unquote. Even having methods for bringing about a higher state of consciousness presented in book form would not be particularly reassuring to people who think like this, because the point is not whether we receive this information as an oral communication or learn about these methods from someone who knows about them and presents them in a book. There are indeed people who are knowledgeable about the rules for developing spiritual organs of perception, but subscribe to the view that these rules should not be entrusted to a book. In general, these people also consider it impermissible to communicate certain truths having to do with the spiritual world. Given the present stage of humankind's evolution, however, this view must be considered outdated in a certain way. It is true that we can go only so far in communicating the rules in question, but the information that can be provided leads far enough so that those who apply it to their own souls will reach a point in the development of their knowledge where they will then be able to discover the rest of the way. Only personal previous experience on the path to spiritual knowledge can give us the right idea about how this path then leads on.